God. Thank you. Thank you very much, brethren, for the, uh, the warm welcome that I continue to have on this side of the Atlantic. As I have said before, uh, many of you have become dear friends, dear colleagues in ministry. And um, yes, I, I cannot imagine uh, what we would have managed to do by now on the African continent if it were not for you holding our hands in the work of ministry. So even as I come to uh, give my final exhortation, again from John chapter 4, uh, I would like to use this opportunity to, to thank the organizers of this conference, um, CBTS, for uh, inviting me to be a part of it. And uh, I'm glad to notice that uh, next year you will have again one of us, uh, Dr. Vodi Bokam. I know you think he's American, we think he's African. <laughs> <laughs> We've laid our claim on him. Uh, so yeah, it's good to see that uh, he will be uh, here. And again, that provides me an opportunity to say, don't disappear without passing through the African Christian University stand and see how you could partner with us. And the African Pastors Conferences. Those two uh, are very dear to my own heart. Good, well, let's uh, go back then to John and chapter four as we continue to look at worship in spirit and truth. I will draw your attention once again to verse 19 down to verse 26. John chapter 4, beginning with verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. As I come to give the, the final address at this conference, I must say I really have appreciated the glorious tapestry that has been knit together by the various messages that have been given. It's come out ultimately as a kind of beautiful painting from different angles. And therefore, I will be going away truly blessed, especially with the thought that God should have invited a person like me to be part of that angelic host together with all the redeemed to worship him, not only in time, but much more in eternity. I think I'm going away in that sense with a full heart. Well, my part has really been to open up these words of our Lord to the Samaritan woman. Again, to give the context, she was seeking to move him away 
from what would have been a very uncomfortable subject, her own immoral living. And as she threw the cat among the pigeons, our Lord still took her on even then, but brought out eternal truths that have become beneficial to all of us over history. He began by showing her the way in which old covenant worship was soon to be made obsolete. To borrow his own words, the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So we spent a bit of time looking at that form of worship that was there that was now to become obsolete. It's interesting that after the temple worship had already been put into place because primarily of the dispersion of the Israelites, synagogue worship also became a norm. And Jesus himself participated in synagogue worship as we are familiar with, um, bringing out yet another aspect of what is largely still Old Testament worship although it was not around the sacrificial system. It was primarily a kind of educational institution where God's truth in its uh, Old Testament sense was still being taught among God's scattered people. But then, to get back to our subject, our Lord Jesus then went on to speak about worship in the New Testament era, speaking in terms of the fact that the time had come, it now was when true worshipers would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's something, again, that we opened up quite a bit yesterday. I brought out the fact that these were two sides of the same coin, so it's not sort of worshipping in spirit, this side, and then another thought in terms of worshipping in truth, but rather this spirit and truth being combined and describing what true worship was to be in the New Testament. And we also went on to say that each of these could in many ways be opened up into categories. So that which is in spirit, being spiritual, but then that which is brought about by the Holy Spirit. And similarly, that which is in truth, being truthful, but again being brought out by the truth, God's revelation. So each of those coming out in that way. And we noticed how the Apostle Paul spoke about it in, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, that those of us who are New Testament believers are those who worship God, motivated by, enabled by the Spirit of God. Or, as he puts it in, in Romans 8, talking about prayer, he said we do not know how or what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit is the one who enables us to do so with groans that words cannot express. It is the Spirit of God who enables us to worship in spirit. We also mention the fact that um, it's based on truth, and then we are responding by making sure that what we believe is the way in which we live. And whereas Old Testament worship was largely developed around the Exodus, New Testament worship is developed around Jesus Christ's salvation or the redemption, that which is ultimately the truth that is prefigured by the Exodus in the book, in the Old Testament book of uh, 
Exodus. <laughs> and so we, 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 we must keep that in mind, even as we will be proceeding into our third and final message, that there is the centrality of preaching that gives birth to true worship. It's, it's through the word that individuals, by the work of the Spirit, are regenerated. It is through the word that we are sanctified. And at the heart of it all is the gospel, God's great redemptive work through Jesus Christ. And just as an aside, um, I think our, our brother Scott has been leading us through uh, at least one of his messages on, on the Psalms. And we, we ought to sing the Psalms. In fact, if there's a way in which we are in error, we don't sing as much as we ought to the Psalms that are there in the Bible. But it is exclusive psalmody that really becomes something we ought to question. And it's because of the fact that it leaves us with that which is the type instead of the full teaching of the gospel. And so, really, in the Christian church, yes, we, we ought to sing uh, the Psalms, there's no doubt about it, but we, we, we need the full orbed truth as it has been realized in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love the way in which Peter puts it in uh, First Peter and chapter 2, speaking about the Christian church and the, some aspect of this worship. Peter says, um, but you are a chosen generation or a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what worship is. It's acknowledging his worth, his excellency. And then it says there, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That should come out even as we are worshiping. We need to combine the Old Testament truths and pass them through Calvary, pass them through the resurrection, and then see this full-orbed truth as we saw from Ephesians 1. In this third message, I want us to look at Jesus' assertion that the Father seeks such worshippers. And then also, I want us to see the reason that Jesus gives. And the reason he gives lies in the nature of God. I think, first of all, the statement itself should be a little puzzling. The assertion that Jesus makes about God seeking worshippers. We are told there in uh, halfway through verse 23, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Now, if we know the God of the Bible, the true God of heaven and earth, we should know that he is sufficient in himself. He doesn't need anything outside himself. He is not like us. We have a sense of need that drives us out there in the world to seek all kinds of things, friendships, partners, food, clothing, shelter, even the very air that we breathe. But God from eternity to eternity, is blessed forever. And therefore, the very thought that God should be seeking causes us to pause for a moment because, strictly speaking, he doesn't need us, and I hope we believe that. 
So what would Jesus have had in mind when he spoke in terms of God doing this? Zeteo, seeking, looking for, desiring. What is it that he had in mind? Well, quickly, it does not necessarily suggest a need on the part of God. Definitely, God does not need anything outside himself. Rather, what it's referring to is something that is commensurate with, corresponding to, being appropriate to a person's likes, a person's makeup, a person's character, a person's characteristics. So let me try and illustrate it, and I hope you will see the point. I want to illustrate it in terms of food. So we all need food in order to survive. So in that sense, we seek food. We desire food. We look for food. Now, that's not the way in which Jesus would have been speaking about the Father seeking such to worship him. But rather, it's in terms of not so much us needing food or wanting food or desiring food, but us desiring a certain kind of food. Now, at that point, it changes the topic. Because, for instance, you people here, you, you love, or well, some of you, you love seafood, oysters, lobsters, crabs, shrimp, and so on. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I come from a landlocked country. And so such food is totally foreign to my test buds. Okay, so it's not that you need that food to survive. Otherwise, I would be dead. <laughs> it's that that kind of food links up with the way your taste buds have developed over so many centuries. It's the kind of people that you are that gives you that kind of food. Where I come from, we have our own type, which, yeah, if you came, you'd look at and say, sorry, excuse me. Uh, I'm looking for a McDonald's or whatever uh, to survive over here. So it's in that sense that Jesus is speaking about God seeking, looking for, desiring. It is in terms of the kind of being he is, therefore, this is the kind of worship that links up with him. Hence the statement that he makes immediately after that, after saying, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him, immediately says, God is spirit. And therefore, he says, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Let's back up a little bit. Why did God create the universe? He did not need it. Why did he make this vast, vast, vast universe that up to today, our most powerful telescopes are only beginning to scratch the surface. Why? Well, the truth is, it was simply in order for him to reveal himself. He desired to reveal himself. And as he revealed himself, his excellences, his qualities, began to be manifested in such a way that all his created beings, all his creatures, can see something of who he is and thus 
inevitably worship him. In the book of Romans and chapter 1, we have those wonderful stories that rather wonderful words that make the lack of worship inexcusable. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and that's the first word, by the way, before unrighteousness. In other words, the failure for human beings to relate to God the way they ought to relate to him. Who by the unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And then he says, for although they knew God, in other words, He's revealed enough of himself for human beings to sense the God who is there. They did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory, there it is, the glory of the immortal God for Images that they themselves are making. Images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We could go on. The point there is that it's not so much that God needed something as the fact that God was pleased to make creation that in that sense, he would be known for who he is. And that also explains why in his eternal counsel, he included the fall in Genesis 3. It was not an accident. It did not take him by surprise. He was not biting his nails while that was happening. It was so that he could manifest himself both as a God of justice and wrath and as a God of grace right. and mercy, which brings out worship to God for who he is. So that's creation. That's history. It brings us to the end of human history, the ushering in of eternity, and indeed, we join in with the angels to ascribe worship to him for all eternity. Well, Jesus here is saying that as we get into this New Testament, we are in fact heading in that direction. There is this growing fullness of truth that is also Wash, producing worship that is closer to the kind of God who is there. For me, this statement, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him, settles the question with respect to the regulative principle. God determines what kind of people and what kind of worship should come to him. He's the one who is saying, this is what I desire. This is what I seek. This is what I am looking for. And friends, it only makes sense. When people are going to church and they're thinking primarily about whether they will enjoy something, this is something I enjoy doing, they're missing the whole point. Because remember, the church is God's household. It belongs to him. 
the activities that are there are primarily activities he wants. If you were to come to my home and you are bringing me some gifts or you are bringing food for me, I'm sure if you know me, you will not bring lobsters <laughs> and oysters and all the rest of it because you love that food you will begin with who I am. And then you will say, let's go and buy that which he desires. That in itself settles the point of the question that we then should be asking ourselves as we go to the place of worship. What is it that he himself has said? What is he seeking? What does he desire? What is he looking for? And Jesus answers that question, which in another way is simply, how then should we worship? And Jesus answers by saying, we must begin with the kind of God who is there. God is spirit. He tells us there. John has a way of using a small phrase and hang onto it an entire world of thought. He's the one who has also already told us in one of his other letters that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. He's also the one who's given us the famous phrase, God is love. And all that is meant to, to, to enable us to bring, as it were, the, the full revelation of God in, in one area to, to sit on a simple phrase. In one sense, simple, but in another, becoming fairly complex. So, for instance, I'm just quoting here from the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, which no doubt borrows this from the Westminster Confession. And this is the way it puts it. The Lord our God is but one only living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only hath immortality. In other words, he alone possesses true life, eternal life dwelling in the light which no one can approach unto, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, everywhere, infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute. I'd like to suggest to you that a lot of those thoughts uh, standing on that little phrase, God is spirit. This is the God who is there. To worship any other than the one represented by those words is to worship a God of our own imagination. To put it another way, we are worshiping an idol. It's not the God of the Bible. And that's one reason why any attempt to, to imagine God in some physical form, it doesn't matter how beautiful that physical form might be, is to steal from his glory. He is spirit. We cannot 
reduce him to any physical structure. Hence, the second of the Ten Commandments, as you very well know. And that immediately, therefore, removes every form of idolatry. God is not to be worshipped through that imaginative structure that we may have put together. Therefore, what is God saying? Because of who he is. Well, it's essentially what we looked at yesterday. That if this is the kind of God who is there, then surely it only makes sense that the only ultimate way, full expression of worship that would be satisfying, fulfilling, bringing pleasure to him is worship in spirit and in truth. And that's what Jesus is saying here. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. These are the kind of worshipers the Father is seeking. So let me quickly again just summarize something of the worship in spirit and in truth that we spoke about yesterday before I finally come to wrap all this up. Remember, today my main goal is not the description of spirit and truth, but that God is seeking this kind of worshipers. This is the kind of worship that brings delight to him, that he finds pleasure in. Well, as we saw yesterday, the phrase in spirit is obviously emphasizing spiritual, God cannot be boxed into one place. He is omnipresent. He is spirit. And therefore, the worship that he accepts is spiritual. But remember, it is worship that the, the Holy Spirit alone is able to produce. I've never forgotten the words of uh, and. John, in again quoting our Lord Jesus Christ in, in chapter 3, verse 6, that were expounded when I was a very young Christian many, many years ago, and where Jesus says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. And my pastor then, um, sitting, I was sitting in the, the front pew, belabored the point that you as a human being, the most you can produce is that which is like you. Flesh can only give birth to flesh. The moment you begin thinking in terms of that which is truly spiritual, that which God can accept, we are absolutely impotent. Absolutely. We are dependent on the Spirit of God. All the way from conversion, which is preceded by regeneration, the Spirit must give life before men and women can repent and trust in Him. Worship is exactly the same. The Spirit of God alone is the one who can bring about true worship. And he is not limited to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion. The Spirit of God hovers over the entire earth. And therefore, here in Louisville, we can render, as we saw yesterday, true worship if the Spirit of God works in our hearts and works among us. That's the worship that God delights in. Spirit-inspired worship. But we also saw yesterday that this is to be based on truthfulness, 
that is a fruit of the truth. The truth. The truth in terms of God's revelation. God has revealed himself. He's revealed the way in which he wants us to worship him. He's revealed all that. Ours is therefore not to be hypocritical, not to be other than that which he has revealed, but we are to worship him according to that which he has revealed. Remember, again, gospel-centeredness. We are to be a people that have not only experienced the gospel, transforming our lives, but we are to be a people that fill our minds with gospel-centered truth. So that that informs the way in which we worship. I want us to just hold those two things together. Having experienced the gospel, but at the same time, filling our minds, not with some physical image of God, but with the truths of God. And that inflames our hearts to render to him true worship. That suggests two quick things before I move on. One is the fact that non-Christians are obligated to worship God because he's their creator. So our children should also be coming with us to the place of worship. We, we should challenge anybody and everybody that worship is something that we do primarily because the creator has revealed himself through the things he has made. Surely, if we've got any eyes to see, we should say, wow! Whoever is behind this is great and glorious. The problem is that being fallen creatures, they are unable to do that, unable to give the worship that is due to God. They have not experienced the gospel. They may have the truths taught to them, but they lack the inner workings of the spirit that make this flow through their beings. The second is on the opposite end, and it's this. It's possible for us to have experienced God's truth and yet to go into the place of worship mindlessly. You are in church, but you're thinking about the hamburger that you'll be having after church. You are doing everything else except engaging yourself, your mind, with that which you have to do with God. And let's face it, brethren, that's something that we need to learn to discipline ourselves about. And that's why when, when you come to the time of worship, it's important first to pause, pause, and say to yourself, what am I doing here? What have I come for? And, and, and fill your mind with these great and glorious grandeur truths of God and his great salvation. So that as you then engage in specific worship, you are doing it acceptably. Acceptably. It's easy to become 
so used to worship that we forget that it's based on truthfulness and that the God before whom we have come knows where our minds are. He knows that you are completely disconnected. He knows that you are waiting for this whole thing to quickly finish so that you can get out there and do what you really want to do. And it's disgusting to him because he is God. He is spirit. He knows exactly what's going on. We can cheat one another. After all, we are converted. We've got the right words. But in actual fact, we are not truly worshiping him. Jesus here is saying, the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Such people to worship him. That's where he gets the pleasure. He desires not simply a room filled with mindless people. No. He wants those who've experienced the gospel, but whose minds are filled with the truths of God. And then they are pouring those truths out to him. What Jesus says, and with that I quickly hurry on to close, was both a corrective to the Jewish era and the Samaritan era. For the Jews, there was this contentment. We have the truth of God, we have the system in place. We have the temple. We have the priests. We have the sacrifices and so on. But in actual fact, they lacked the heart. They were full of hypocrites. We talked about that, especially the Jewish leaders. So that when now the Messiah himself came, they, they detested him and rushed him to a cruel cross. It was all a public show and God soon shut it down. They lacked the spirit in that sense. The Samaritan era was the exact opposite. Yes, there may have been enthusiasm because they had their own way of worship and they were fighting for it in terms of it being superior and so on on Mount Gerizim. But it was not revealed by God. It was not that which God required of them. As Jesus already said, you are worshiping what you do not know. And so he is correcting that as well by speaking about worship that is in truth. Brethren, here's the good news. In the Christian era, in the new covenant, we have both. What a glorious privilege we have. That with all our failings, all our weaknesses, all that we can add and multiply that disqualifies us from worship, God, through his spirit, is able to work in us so that in the name of Jesus, our worship here on earth can bring pleasure to this great and glorious God. What an opportunity we have. What a glorious opportunity. The angels may worship God. Yes, they do. But they cannot put in that thread of amazing grace. Like, 
percent. What grace have they known? Zero. But you and I can see amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We can sing that way. From the depth of our souls, we can lift the roofs of our worship buildings, especially if we're African. in response to what he has done, inspired by the Spirit. Therefore, let us ever remember who God is. Then we will get our worship right. If we concentrate on what we like or dislike, we will get the numbers, no doubt about it. But our worship will go awfully wrong. It has also beware of dead rituals, simply going through the motions. Let us pray for the Spirit's help. Let us fill our minds with gospel truths. Let us remember that the primary audience of our worship is not ourselves, it is God. He seeks, he delights in, he desires such worshippers. And he's not sitting in Jerusalem waiting for us. He's here. He's here. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. Therefore, let us render to him the worship that befits him. Let's pray. Eternal and gracious God, thank you for these words of our Savior to this woman. Words that over thousands of years have reached us to challenge us afresh in answering the question, how then should we worship? Oh God, help us to worship in spirit and truth. For the sake of your eternal glory, amen.